Now, I, it says, now I can receive guests. This is so exciting. It's like Thanksgiving. Like, you'll just come to your house. Hey, guys, I know that you're either on Christmas break or you're, you know, finishing the last few days of school. So you're not actually hurting anybody before you go on Christmas break. Because remember, um, we love the children and we love their parents, even if they do not bring you a Christmas gift. Do you guys all give Christmas gifts to your teachers? Like, did y'all all do that? All of you gave Christmas gifts to your teachers? No, not coal. Christmas gifts. <laughs> yes. Um, I didn't do that. I just didn't do that. I mean, I did that in elementary school. I don't, I gave them end of the year gifts. Um, cause then you have Christmas gifts. You have teacher appreciation week. You have end of the year. Where's the parent gift? Like I never, I never got the parent gift. But anyway, we're going to ask questions. Um, you guys are coming in to like a really pivotal time of the year. A lot of you guys are deciding um, that you're ready to be a more robust member of the IEP team and you're talking about kind of training opportunities. So these are questions that we've gotten ahead of time. Um, and again, we always uh, we go live at 7 o'clock on Tuesday nights, um, Ask the Advocate. So if there are questions you want to ask ahead of time, just send them ahead of time and we're not going to you know disclose your identity. We're not going to say, Sandy Smith at Dallas Independent School District wants to know. We're not going to do all that. There's no Sandy Smith. At, well, there, there probably is a Sandy Smith. At, um, yes, I give holiday gifts. That's so fantastic. So, all right, let's hear the questions, kids. Um, um, Alicia, do you have any questions from the kids? I have one. First, right off the bat, okay. what do I, my child is failing in a subject, they have an IEP, and they have an IEP. Well, you, I mean, there's, there's a lot around that, right? If your child is failing... Um, you first have to figure out why are they failing. A lot of times the grades have not been put in by teachers. Um, if the grade is their actual grade, um, I would have a, a teacher conference. You can do that by Zoom. It's really easy to do that now. Um, you could have an IEP and not be around a content area. But I, I first address it with the um, teacher. You always want to go up the, the correct chain of command. Perfect. Thank you so much. And then I had another one. They said that they got their IEP progress reports, and all the, on every goal, their child showed um, insu insufficient progress. What should they do? So I would want to know, so there's several components on the IEP progress report. It should say, um, is progress being made so the student will, will meet the annual goal? Is there something additional the student needs? There should also be a comment section. In that comment section, it should give you the why. Um, but you need to make sure that you read that pristinely and then call a parent-teacher conference. Awesome. And then I did have someone ask, what is the academy that you talk about? <laughs> well, it's the academy where I won an Oscar. No. So the Special Education Academy um, is to train people, every person that sits at the IEP table, the parent, the related service providers, the instructional service providers, the principals, the paras, the teachers, the special ed teachers, the general ed teachers, everyone that sits at the IEP table. And so we have the academy, which meets every Tuesday night. Um, we do about two hours of training. It's on the law, the law, the law. It's on the law, the real law. Um, and um, so that everybody gets properly equipped to negotiate um, successful student outcomes. And you get to visit with all these people behind the screen. Yes. And then at the end, we open it up for questions. And I'm very bad at wrapping up the questions, but um, because we want to answer everybody's questions because people's questions are valid. Yes. yes. Uh, Michelle says she's asking for raw data sheets for her child. How long should I give them to produce the sheets? Seven seconds. Give them seven seconds. <laughs> no. So, you know, raw data collection sheets is a new language that I am now spreading throughout the land. I'm sure it will be a LOAT requirement in some school districts soon. Speaking Karen. So raw data collection sheets are assumptive for me, right? I assume that you were taking data weekly. So um, if that doesn't work, I would uh, put in a FOIA request, a Freedom of Information Act request, um, and request all uh, pieces of paperwork that have your child's full name on them or that has your student's ID on them um, and drive that over to legal with your driver's license, two original copies, be very specific about what you're asking for, and then have the clerk or whoever receives that each sign an original copy, and then that starts a 45-day timeline, a 45 calendar days. So if you take it today, a lot of you guys are still in school, then it's 45 days from then, it's due. Perfect. 
Um, Big Daddy Q33 says, <laughs> why does eighth grade transition IEPs bring up work and classes they will take in high school? Oh, that's a really good question because um, in the reenactment of IDEA in 2004, we added transition. And what that means is before that, we were graduating, we were finally in including kids with disabilities, but we were just graduating them and say, bye, have, have, have a good life. But now there's a legal requirement called transition, which at the latest starts at 16 by federal law. Some states have increased the benefit of IDEA and started as soon as 14, which is why you're looking at that at eighth grade. And it's to get them ready for post-secondary success, gainful employment, independent living, and further education. That is the three thresholds of transition, right? Gainful employment, independent living, and further education. And everybody is employable, even if it's supported vocation. And so we began to partner with the student to see what are their preferences and their interests, 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 their interests post-secondary, so that we can make sure that we're programming for that, bringing in um, services, and um, making sure that we have all the <laughs> minutes and supports that they need. I just want to say for the record, not that there is a record, but these people behind here are not being well behaved. I just wanted to say. Um, someone asked, can you go to North Georgia and show the school board what they're doing wrong? Can I go to North Georgia? Um, yep, can you? I am going to the capital soon, which of course I'm pretty sure we don't know what the capital is. Do y'all know what the capital of Georgia is? I feel like it should be Atlanta. Atlanta. Is it Atlanta? It is. is it? I think it is. The two people behind me that graduated college. Um, but yes, I'm going to the capital of Georgia soon. Um, but no, I don't go and tell school boards what they're doing. I, school boards, respectfully, are politicians. And as somebody who's a past commissioner for the mayor's office for people with disabilities in Houston, two terms, a lot of nothing goes on in politics. A lot of talking, not a lot of action. So I'm all about the doing um, so several people have put in Atlanta, Augusta. Oh, good. See, I'm. <laughs> we're finding it out for Augusta or Atlanta. It's Atlanta. I googled it. Ma'am, we will let the people speak. <laughs> I can I can come play golf with you in Augusta, and then we'll go see a Braves game in Atlanta. Perfect. Um, Carrie Ann said, "Can pragmatic speech be done by a social worker, or should I fight for it to be done by speech?" What the hello, kitty? Are you, I know you're making this up. This is, these are really good pretend questions. Can speech be done by a social worker? Let's pray about that. No. It, it's a no. Because they're not speechers. They're social workers. Um, I had a, um, um, an individual the other day providing counseling as a related service in Texas. But she's a social worker. Do you guys think that was a problem for me? It's going to be a problem for this school. Yeah. Amen. Um. <laughs> Kid has an RBT. Does the parent have to be notified if services change? What's an RBT? We're, we're a bacon tomato. I don't know what that is. So you have to be notified if there's a consideration of change. Period. That's that's the law. And you, that's part of a prior written notice. So prior written notice is required when there's a consideration of any kind of a change. Um, but no, not only have to be notified, you have to participate in those decisions. Okay, Leah from Ohio says, thank you for advocating for those with an IEP. Thank you. Um, remar remarkable Reese. Oh, wait, Re registered behavioral therapist. Thank there you. you thank you, Mellow MI. Yeah. Yeah, whatever, whatever's providing a product to the student that's part of their educational plan, um, if there's a consideration of cha uh, change, then you have to have that. All right. Um, Remarkable Reese said, what is your opinion on cross-categorical programs? Did you say crack? I, I think not. she said, what's my opinion on crack? And I want to say for the record, crack <laughs> is whack. <It's> whack. <laughs> Next question, ma'am. I don't, these people, I, I think they might be into the nog, if you know what I mean. The holiday nog. Can you ask your question, ma'am? Under yes. and a PG, can you opinion? ask a PG question? My Lord. What is your opinion on cross-categorical programs? Cross-categorical programs. Well, first of all, it's hard to say. You know, I, I have an opinion about everything. It doesn't really matter what my opinion is. I really see kids struggle with the more that 
with more that we put on their plate with disabilities. We have um, all of these um, dual immersion classes, and I don't know why a child with a cognitive disability is in Mandarin when he's five, but he speaks English. I have no idea. Um, I think that we need to get back to the basics of educating children, teaching them boundaries, um, responsibilities, um, teaching reading, teaching writing, teaching mathematics. And when the teacher says stop, they stop. And when the teacher says for them to do something, they say, yes, ma'am. Um, we got to get back to doing that. So the cross-contaminated battery of the kryptonite, I'm not a fan of. Awesome. Someone asked, what is the two-day training that you talk about? Oh, the two-day intensive is, let, let me ask the girls behind me, is it intensive? Yes. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Lordy, it is. It's very intensive. So the two-day training is for you to go back and be the most amazing diagnostician, the most amazing parent, the most amazing advocate, the most amazing principal. Um, so day one is to fully advocate for somebody. And we're, we're all advocates. Um, and then day two is how to be a professional advocate. You should be able to start your own advocacy business after the two-day intensives. And we have them in person, and then we have them on demand online. And when is your next in-person one. My next in-person is January 14th and 15th, which is great because that's the um, holiday weekend of Martin Luther King Jr. Day, so that gives teachers a chance to slide in there. Somebody asked, how is it intensive? Um, because you will learn, you will learn more before noon than you've learned in all of your teaching. That, I guarantee you. I can back that up. Information from the fire hose. Yeah, it's a fire hose, yes. Yeah. Great. Uh, thank you for that. Um, what if a psych refuses to reevaluate a child because she thinks the family is only doing it for SSI? So um, that's a really good question. So for my kiddos that are going to be uh, probably recipients of adult services, within one calendar year of them graduating, I have all of their evaluations redone. Why do I have that done? for adult services and also if there's going to be guardianship that makes it much easier before the probate court to note um, the acuity and severity of a student's disability. And a psych's opinion about somebody's, um, the why of why they want testing is moot, right? If a parent wants testing and it's been more than a year, you cannot legally deny a parent testing once they are already in special education. We, we gotta get that part right. Amen. And that was for Brooke. Thank um, you, Brooke. Scratch your mom 14 <laughs> said, are there advocates for parents who struggle to communicate at IEPs in Wisconsin? Yes. Us. We have advocates with for parents who struggle to communicate in any state. Um, but, you know, uh, it's not that parents struggle to communicate. Unless you're trained in the law, the application of the law, state statutes, um, case law, uh, U.S. Supreme Court law, which we train on all of that, you're, you're just outmanned. You are outmanned. Schools have told people no a gazillion times. They're more ready to tell you no for whoever's training them than they are to know about um, their obligations as it relates to federal and state law. And, you know, having a child with a disability is a full-time job. Becoming an advocate is a full-time job. So we don't expect parents who are trying to get through Thursday to know about all the laws in their state and federal laws and the application of them. Yes. Um, super mom in New York. Um, she is working with a mother that she has a, a five-year-old autistic son and the school district told her they must put her son in residential. Is that legal? So, must and have to, I don't know what that means. There are children, I probably have, I don't know, this year, I do about 500 IEP meetings a year. Probably right now I have seven kiddos right now that are at, out of district placement. Um, and some of those are residential. Um, it depends on the acuity of the student's need and every student's need is different. Um, I would assume that there is a, a mountain of data that would support that recommendation. And then 
Mary says, is asking for late arrival for a kid with sleep issues appropriate to add to an IEP? So that's a really good question. I have a lot of kiddos that have um, diagnosed by a medical professional um, sleep apnea that greatly impacts their ability to get to school. And then additionally, it impacts their ability to participate once they get to school. Um, it's going to be very hard to take away the criteria for the content that has to be taught at that time, but you can certainly have it added to a 504 plan or an IEP. Okay, um, Mama Boy asked, so they dropped off a formal request for data and um, the school district refused to sign the receipt and said they would deal with it later. What are some steps they could take? So I would take a picture of the person holding the piece of paper and then you have a picture with the timestamp on the date. I would have a picture of you. Here's, here I am at um, Goofball Independent School District and here I am inside the building. Here's a picture of me handing it to Mrs. Smith. Whatever she chooses to do with that is up to her. Still starts a 45 day paper uh, calendar timeline. Deal with it later is a violation of federal law under FERPA and FOIA. Okay, very good. Are there, let's see, any crochets I would like to know, are there any drawbacks to having an IEP? So there's always a drawback to having an IEP. So we know that we're always negotiating two things in special ed, meaningful benefit and harmful effect. We're always negotiating them, whether or not the student leaves the class. And so when you're looking at the LRE page, which is a consideration, one of the questions should be, do we believe there's going to be a harmful effect? The answer in the IEP is always yes. We always believe there's going to be a harmful effect, but, but we believe based on the IEP that we've constructed that the mean, any meaningful benefit will outweigh any harmful effect. Exactly. So Tim Ng asked, how do I ask for a one-to-one -one aid for my autistic kiddo who has epilepsy? Um, if taken out of stack. I'm not sure about stack. Okay. So when you're asking for anything, you have to bring the data. You have to have the data that supports that. And so if that data kind of, and I don't know, your kiddo, if that data is like maybe you have some supporting evidence from your uh, neurologist or your pediatrician or whoever sees him for um, the totality of his disabilities, I would bring that forward and present that at a meeting. Okay, great. Is there a limit to how many accommodations a child can have in an IEP? Unfortunately, no. Um, so here's what I say is a good rule for people that um, are affiliates of ours or people that we're training. Um, I don't want to see more than nine accommodations in an IEP. Why? Because uh, teachers, although they are superheroes and they are angels that walk on this earth, no teacher is going to stand up and give Billy... 32 accommodations in reading, and then say good morning. So a lot of times we have so many accommodations because we don't want to give them the right special ed services. So we, then, we, again, we've just dumped it back onto the general ed teacher. Yep. Um, Thank you, Emily just, Diaz. Oh, yeah. there's there's our, okay. our landline. Can we just can we just, can here. we just give it a round of applause for the landline? We love the landline and the cheese head. Cheese token. And the cheese head. Yeah. I was about to say, cheese head is here. <laughs> Let's see. How, so I finally got a 504 for my daughter, but the accommodations aren't being followed. What should I do? You should probably hire somebody who's really good at filing with the U.S. Department of Education Office of Civil Rights. I know someone. Because the Office of Civil Rights does not take kindly to that at all. So there's 11 circuit courts and there are 11 um, offices at the U.S. Department of Education Office of Civil Rights. And your accommodations are a civil right. They're not negotiable. They're not optional. Um, and they're not a bingo draw. We don't just like take a couple out or pick, pick what you want. Exactly. Someone asked, how do you register for the in-person training? Um, in the registration. Was that a good answer? That was a terrible answer. So if you go to the thing above my hairdo, there's a link in the deal of the thing. Um, so just go to Special Education Academy, whether you want to do the online on-demand, um, I mean virtual on-demand, or the two-day intensive. 
And then somebody right. else is, a couple people have asked. So we do have a program after the two day. Is that, was that one of the questions, um, Alicia? Uh, yes. Yeah, someone asked, um, uh, what the mastermind is. They went to your website and they seen it listed, but there's a prerequisite. So they wanted more information about that. Okay. So the mastermind we started last year, uh, because there are people that wanted to know literally exactly. I wanted to train them. Which what, with what I think the most important pieces are of IDEA, how to negotiate with people, um, how to work with attorneys, how to work with school districts, how to really be the advocate that makes change that's purposeful for a student with a disability. And so it's 10 weeks long. It's two hours each. We cap them. They're small groups. Um, but it is the, uh, the prerequisite to take the mastermind is you have to have attended the two-day if you haven't attended the two-day, then you wouldn't be eligible to participate in the mastermind. Uh, but those are for people that want to be full-time advocates um, and want to have all all that they need to be fully ready to go into an IEP the same way that I would. <clears throat> Perfect. And then um, just to go off of that, we had someone ask, who is a teacher? How can they become an advocate? Come on down. Just come on. Like, it, it's not rocket science. Um, come to our trainings. Our trainings are, I guarantee my trainings, they're that good. I, if you saw my linen closet, you would know I'm not very good at that. But training people for special education is the thing that I'm on this earth to do. And we want you to be fully trained so that you can be an effective advocate. We have 7.5 million children have an IEP. Probably 40 million have a ridiculous 504. So... I need advocates. The students need advocates. Parents need advocates. Uh, great schools need advocates because good advocates partner with school districts. So actually talking about 504, someone asked, is the 504 going away in Texas? That is hysterical. That's like saying it's hairspray going away in Texas. The answer would be no. No, yeah. civil rights don't go away in Texas. Civil rights are... You're right because you're a citizen of the United States of America. Exactly. So someone asked, uh, we had a comment earlier. Someone was asking about um, how much training school psych psychologists have in special education law. So I don't know how much training um, school psychologists have in special education law. Um, I, I did see in a few of the comments. So I made a video and I'll say it again. I don't know why you expect school-based members to know federal law and state statutes. The state statutes in Texas are almost 400 pages long. They're updated every two years with about 40 new pages just for Texas. So um, I appreciate that some of you might have had a special law training. Um, that's like saying I had one training in something. So um, people at the IEP table, it's just my experience, I only do 500 IEP meetings a year. Um, plus mediations and federal filings and state filings and due process. I don't run across any school-based members that know special education law because that's not their specialty. That's not what they're doing day in and day out. Um, IDEA is 115 pages long. Um, they have updates, reenactments. And then there's OSEP, the Office of Special Education Programs, which is always sending out new updates. So um, I, I've never been able to lean into an LSSP or a psychologist or a psychiatrist or a diagnostician for special ed law at a meeting. And if you have, that's fantastic, but they don't do that every day. So um, that's why you, if you want representation, you need to get somebody that's trained to be an advocate. Alicia, do you have your, you have your hand up? Yeah, we had, a, we had a good one pop up at the bottom. Um, oh, but first, can we just say that... Um, um, a being 80, um, 82 is a, is a admin and you, Karen, are her spirit animal. Thank oh, you. Yes. thank you guys. Love you right back. Yes. Um, Gator Girl said, how should an advocate respond to a staff who sigh and roll their eyes when the advocate speaks? I would say, um, do you need a minute to take a break? Because it looks like you're having some sort of medical concern at this moment. So one of the things that I teach people in my mastermind and the people behind me are I teach you how to work with people. A good advocate should lead the meeting because my job is to partner the parents and the school-based members. If you're going to act like you're two, I'm going to see if you need a nap. But I don't participate in meetings like that. 
Um, I will say it's really distracting when you're making all those puffing noises over there. Do you need a minute? Because you're dishonoring my client and it's unacceptable. Amen. Um, we all need to cheer for serving my purpose. She had an IEP meeting for her 10 year old who has autism and they finally made huge progress. She is just sharing her mama pride. Good. Good job. Congratulations. Yes. Um, Tiffany said, can I ask for proof from the general education teacher showing she is accommodating her daughter's assignments? So you should be able to see most accommodations, right? If I'm chucking the assignment, then I'm not giving you the same assignment that I gave everybody else. Um, if there's a lot that you can actually see, right? If you're giving them visual aids, give me a copy of it, right? I don't know that I would use the word prove to me. That doesn't usually go over well. Uh, but I would just say, hey, can you just tell me how you're um, applying the accommodations to my kiddos' work and testing? I would I go in for the soft lob. I know it's surprising to some, some of you. Um, but, yeah, I assume competence. Really, I do. I do. And then sometimes I'm wrong. Um, Andrew, who sounds like he may be a teacher... Um, is it legal to withhold the complete IEP document from a teacher of an IEP student? No. No, of course the team should have access. The people providing the educational product need to have access to the student's cumulative folder, much less the IEP. Okay, and then Kimmy has quite a few, so I'm going to just kind of summarize them because it's a story. So basically her child um, has an IEP and she's called daily to go and pick them up because they have some behavioral issues in class, but they are denying a one-to-one. -one. So what can she do? She, she, you know, she just feels like there's plenty of data to show he needs more support, but the school is, is just pushing back on it and she's just having to pick them up every day. So when they call you to pick them up, I would say I'm happy to pick him up. However, I'm going to need an email confirming that you're unable to provide him an educational benefit as it relates to his behavior. And even if they won't do that, when you get home, Kimmy, I would send an email and say, hey, today is December 19th. Again, I had to pick up my child because you're unable to provide him a FAPE, a free appropriate public education, as it relates to his behavioral needs. And I document it. Trish asks, can a specialized reading program like Wilson be written into the IEP as a mandated service? So about brand names. <laughs> Um, schools are not fans of brand names, and I understand that. We do want to make sure that we have a robust, um, research-based, um, phonics-based, <laughs> success-based um, reading program that benefits the students. And I find that most states have um, um, accepted them. It depends on what your district has purchased. But it's unlikely that you're going to make a, a school district use a certain product. Additionally, the product is only as good as the person teaching it. So you could have a great Wilson program, you could have a great OG, you could have great Nye House, you could have a great whatever, but if the person implementing it doesn't really understand the totality of um, the four components of reading, then it's going to be a wash. Yes. Um, Patterson 006 said, intellectual disability, but the assessments are inconsistent with scores. What can be done? So... You ask for, you know, an IEE, independent educational evaluation. I think it's really important to remember students that truly have an intellectual disability, respectfully, um, when you're providing them instruction, it's, it's paramount and obvious to the person providing that instruction. It's not a, does he have it? Did he not get it? It's not something you catch, right? And most kiddos that have an intellectual disability are going to finish out high school around the third grade level or lower. So it's a very important eligibility that we get correct. Um, and it's very important that we don't get it wrong. So there's a million reasons kids don't score well on assessments. Um, could list them all here. One, I don't like you. I don't know you. I don't know why I'm sitting here with you, right? Um, allegedly, I was book smart in school. Allegedly. And I did terrible on testing, like formal testing. So um, I would definitely make sure that you get a great professional to do an outside evaluation. And then I can't find the comment, but I told her and I wrote it down. 
She asks if you can explain the RTI progress, uh, process in Louisiana. Oh, God bless Louisiana. My perfect grandchild and perfect daughter and perfect son-in-law live, live there. So RTI is supposed to be the short intervention, whether it's RTI or MTSS. Um, it just gives the teacher an opportunity to try to give the student a little more targeted intervention um, to see if that can remediate the gap, right? And sometimes it does. It's just good teaching, right? Um, but it's not supposed to go on like my first marriage for years. Correct. Um, uh, uh, Wendy asked about seven times. So, Wendy, I see you, girl. Um, should all aides and para pros have some autism training? Um, all aides and parapos should have the training that we give. They really should, and I wish they did. I'd be happy to make it this online training available to any school district. I do lots of professional developments across the nation. We want to get the training to you. It's life-changing. We had the most amazing paraprofessional um, in our training, front row, A student, and then she, she's going to be the most gangster para now. She just didn't know what she didn't know. You, you're only as good as the information you've been given that you understand and you know how to apply. So if we didn't give them the information, then shame on school districts. Truly, not paras, not aides, not teachers, not special ed teachers. Shame on school districts. You know exactly what you're doing. Leslie is a school psych and L, L, oh gosh. L-S-S-S-S-S-S-P. Yeah, that was in Texas, and she says that Texas requires three hours a year in sped law, but many of them have more, but they're not experts. And and you know what? Three hours a year would like be like me, you know, walking for three hours and wanting to have shredded abs. And I appreciate that. Um, but I mean, sped law. I mean, I'm I'm in the trenches of it every day. Uh, my affiliates have to meet with me a minimum of four hours a month just to get them the baseline of all the new law changes. But um, thank you. I'm glad that you guys have that. Maybe we could get the principals to take that three hours. <laughs> There's that. Yes. Um, Miss Moulton so, said she just had her first 504 meeting, and I wasn't crying when I left, and I felt prepared because of you. So thank oh, you. thank you. Yeah. Um. Trisha, the teacher mom, says, I have thought about leaving teacher. She's a high school special education teacher. How much can an advocate make? So our advocates, advocates have become affiliates for me, and it's a, a process after the mastermind. I require them to start at $50 an hour. Um, so advocates make anywhere from nothing to hundreds of dollars an hour, right? So if you were an advocate and you started out as affiliate for us, um, or for yourself, um, and, and I recommend that if you're going to be an advocate that you would start out charging $50. I wouldn't hire somebody for less than $50 an hour. And you worked 40 hours a week for 50 weeks. That's six figures. I don't know where you live, but that's going to cover my lipstick and my hairspray. Um, and so um, you should make plenty of money to pay for everything that you need in your life. So um, um, it's a year-round job. Special education and clients... They don't care about your Christmas Day. Can I get an amen from the girls in the back? Hello? Amen. Yeah, they don't, they don't care about your Saturday. They don't care about your bar mitzvah. They don't care about your wedding anniversary. They don't care if you're boarding a cruise, right? Um, so it's a business that is year-round. I have, I don't know how many cases that I've gotten literally since Saturday, and there's no school till January 5th. So people need records reviews. People need somebody to give them a good faith response at what they're looking for. So a lot of our advocates solely do uh, consultations. They are still school-based members and they do consultations, consultations out of their state or out of the district because I've been sitting here since March 13th, 2020 on an ethernet cord. I do not attend any of my IEP meetings in person. The reason I don't attend IEP meetings in person is that that way none of us go to prison. But um, anybody could make however much money they wanted to. This this business is untapped. There are no special education advocates. There's a few of them that should be bonked on the head 
with a pool noodle twice. Um, but advocates that really go in there and partner with everybody and bring everybody to the table and refocus everybody. There's just one table. I feel like the special ed table should be a circle that's cut in half, shoved against the wall, and then we're all facing a mirror. Really, because it's not about me, not about anybody else. It's about this kid. And we get so busy with our feelings, our feelings, that we forget that there's a child's entire future at stake. Yes. So, Karen, I have to bring up, I have to bring up, so, um, somebody has a student with BI mm -hmm. who's on a 504. Stop, 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 stop. Nope. It's a no. No, no, no. Nope. No, no, no. no. I'm sorry. Was there a question? I apologize. Yeah. It well, makes me why? insane. Insane that we have duped parents into a child that has a vision impairment, which is a federal eligibility under IDA. I'm sorry, Christina. I apologize. Yes, I just want you to know, because I got to say it now. Over 75% of the children in America that are vision impaired, deaf and hard of hearing, and DHH, I'm sorry, and vision impaired, over 75% of the students in America that have a vision impairment deaf blind deaf and hard of hearing are on a 504 is that egregious it's vile but I, okay so we'll just i'm gonna compose myself okay christina from the top with feeling from the top with feeling um on that lovely notes of the eye and a 504 um next question was um somebody has a 504 which isn't working and and suggested and the parent suggested and asked for an IEP, but the school for uh, the school based members keep changing the subject on her. How can she address this? How you address it is you get an advocate. Sometimes you got to bite the bullet and get an advocate. Even if it's just to switch this, you, you, you are crippling a child that has a vision impairment without an IEP. And I stand on that. I just did this for a lovely young lady and there's nothing wrong with her ability to communicate but they don't believe you because parents don't know how to take um, action on when they have a dispute with the school that's effectual and it's legal. So you got to do a little fundraiser, get a good advocate, and get that kid in special ed. Definitely. Um, on to other things that don't belong in 504. Um, my <laughs> student is um, low verbal and has an AAC device, but it's not being used at school. It usually stays in the backpack all day. So between accommodations and VOCDs not being implemented are the bulk of my federal filings with the U.S. Department of Education. The U.S. Department of Education Office of Civil Rights takes it very seriously when you've denied a student their ability to communicate in their modality. They take it really serious uh yes 100 percent. so let's see jack asked as a parent that didn't have all the answers it seemed the school looked at me they were looking to me for answers and solutions to problems is that for vi um no that's somebody else so just I've had this experience too, where the school just kind of looks at the parents like, yeah, what, what do you want, Christina? What do you want? what do you want? I want to sit in this meeting because it's so enjoyable. What I want is for him to have an IEP that enables him to make progress in light of his unique circumstances. Andrew F. March 22nd, 2017. It's 20 pages long from the U.S. Supreme Court. Would you like me to read it to you with feeling? So it's the job of the school to educate them based on their disability and their unique circumstances. Oh, 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 okay. Um, Jewel on the Farm, which, by the way, I love that name. What is the name? Um, Jewel on the Farm. Jewel on the Farm. I like that. I had a student, DNQ, from special education. Now they say that she can't have a 504 because she was DNQ'd. You can be re queued and you can qualify again. People can qualify again. Yeah, yeah. Um, let's see. Another question about the mastermind and what that is. 
Sure, so the mastermind is for people that have completed the two-day intensive that want to know uh, exactly what we use when we go into meetings, our documents, our strategies, the way that we work with people um, that we've learned and um, it's um, have mastered over the years of advocating for kids. Um, it's two hours each session. It's 10 weeks long. And at the end of it, you will be the world's greatest, amazing, fantastico uh, certified special education academy um, mastermind. And we would back any of those people up to, for advocating for my child or anybody else. Okay, and then someone said, my child has a mobility disability, um, and I'm told that they won't qualify for an IEP. Well, if they have a mobility disability, that would fall under OI, orthopedic impairment, which is a federal eligibility. It's amazing how people identify a federal eligibility and say, but not you. No. Um, I have a teacher asking. She has a student that needs um, a speech eval, okay. um, but they were told it's going to take three years. What? Three years? Are they yes. growing an oak tree? No. It, it takes 45 days or 60 days, depending on where you live in the United States. Um, yes, you can attend the two-day intensive virtually. It's on demand right now. Three years? Three years. What? The Hello Kitty, are, I mean, I really, I think some of y'all, your kids go to school and make it up as we go, independent school district. Okay, we might start some fights. Um, dyslexia and federal eligibilities. Can you please explain where dyslexia falls within the eligibility categories for IEPs? Sure, so dyslexia is um, that little unicorn, right? So um, it is under one of the SLDs. It's based on acuity, right? So usually um, case law would support when there is another comorbidity of another SLD, then that dyslexia would best be served by a special education teacher providing that dyslexia instruction. So if you look in your dyslexia handbook, we have an amazing one in Texas. It's called Two Pathways to Instruction. Um, you might have dyslexia that solely rises to the level of being remediated with an amazing dyslexia program. But based on the severity of your comorbidity of other disabilities, you might rise to the level of needing special education dyslexia. So that's if it's special education dyslexia, then it's also uh, the eligibility is SLD. It would just be an additional area under one of the nine um, SLDs. And what would you do if your district has um, decided that dyslexia is no longer an impairment? What would be the next steps for a parent? I would move out of the state of Washington. That's what I would do. And the state of Indiana. You would just move. Because children that can't read are highly likely to not be able to live as adults and work and function and it's probably one of the highest percentages in prisons is children that struggle to read. So speaking of things that districts decide, Landline has decided that potatoes are not a carb. I'm with you. Landline, can you please tell tell my hips that because I have not been correctly vaccinated for the carbs. I had someone ask, um, what do you know about Andrew F? What do I know about Andrew? You're kidding, right? What do That's I know about Andrew F? Um, I don't even think that warrants a response because I saw the goofy response under it. Here's what I don't do. I don't reach down and, and pat barking chihuahuas. Uh, your statement was a distraction. I don't put up with it online. I'm not going to put up with it on this. Chocolate. Um, someone said you are literally shining your her heart. She thanks you for doing this. You make her feel like a better parent. You are great parents. Thank you guys for loving kids and fighting for them. I know what it's like. I've, I've been in your shoes. I've sobbed for hours at night wondering if my kid would ever have any functional um, average needs, if he would ever speak, if he would ever stop biting himself till he bleeds. So I do this because um, I walked through this, and I will not negotiate, waffle, or water down, or waver on my commitment to kids with disabilities. Um, my commitment for 2023 
is no compromise in me in 2023. And those are the people that I want to train. Amen to that. Um, Shirts Mariah? coming. What? Merchandise. Oh. oh. I know Shannon wants to ask the question. Okay, but well, well, while she gets that, Mariah says she's a teacher and she doesn't agree with the student IQ. Can this student be retested? So a student can always be retested, but my question is, you know, I'm not a big fan of just testing, testing, testing. What, why? I have kids that have, are twice exceptional and can't stay seated. I have kids that are gifted and pull their eyebrows out when they work. So a high IQ is sort of a vacuum, right? Um, two things happen in a classroom, instruction and production. And I need to know what I need to do to make sure that I optimize that student's production. If you think retesting him and identifying a higher IQ changes how he shows up, then I think that's purposeful. But if not, I wouldn't retest. Now, can Shannon ask a question, Alicia? Alicia's a teacher. You know, teachers, they like to be in charge. It's my turn now. It's, it's your turn. Uh, Shannon, you in the back. Sharon, do it while you can before she changes her mind. <laughs> okay, okay. All right. Uh, Tara says, any advice on handling teachers bullying my child because I'm advocating for her? Yes. So, um, I, I mean, I file retaliation all the time with OCR cases. You don't get to retaliate against parents. You certainly don't get to retaliate against students. Um, and that is just the, the highest level of smallness that you would take something out on a child. Like, really, what are you? What are you, three years old? If you take things out on a child, then you should work at the back of a warehouse somewhere, not around children. Agreed. Uh, let's see. If a school is underscoring, am I allowed to transfer my child? Um, are you allowed to transfer your child? I mean, transfer has so many, like, webs in it, right? I, transfer is my last thing. If I can get an educational product from this location, I'm going to get it. If it's not available here, then that's a different conversation. So somebody just asked a question I've seen a couple times. If you're already a professional advocate, can you take the mastermind? You can after you take the two-day intensive because the mastermind, I don't answer questions that we taught for 20 hours in the two-day intensive, right? Because that wouldn't be responsible with the other people's time. Um, but certainly we have people that have done the mastermind that were already advocates and now are even more ridiculously amazing, but the prerequisite is non-negotiable. You have to take the two-day intensive either in person or online. Y'all better say something before the teacher jumps over y'all. Right. right. Okay. Okay. Go. Okay. Okay, Carrie Ann has asked a couple times, how long should I wait for OT devices to be implemented in the classroom after the IEP meeting? Five seconds. Okay. Yeah. Boom, chocolate. Ba -dum -ba -boom. boom. Yeah. What do you think of getting rid of the SLD discrepancy? So let's talk about that. That's part of the mastermind. So uh, in 2004... One of the adjustments to IDEA was removing the severe discrepancy model. Severe discrepancy model. So um, there are states that have adapted, adopted a discrepancy model, a cross-battery model, an RTI model. I think all of them are fine if you have um, an ethical LSSP or diagnostician providing those tests uh, that really get to know the student. But the severe discrepancy model was just like, you have to be at 100 and you have to have two deviations from the norm. And that just got to be a hot mess. So that was actually one of the components that was actually changed in the reenactment of IDEA in 2004. How often should a student be um, test have their IQ tested? Uh, I, again, why? I, I mean, I don't, you know, allegedly I have a high IQ. You can't always tell. Right. IQ is just a measurement of brain skills. It doesn't mean uh, necessarily you could have high IQ, which is high crystallized intelligence, and you could have low fluid intelligence, which is part of the trains that we just finished on Special Education Academy. And so crystallized intelligence, I can always add to. Right. Um, unlike the people behind the screen here. 
And fluid intelligence is that ability with automaticity to know what to do next in a novel situation. And sometimes I'd rather you have higher fluid fluid knowledge than next necessarily crystallized knowledge. So it's a it's a totality of how the kiddos cooked. And we looked at the we look at those seven brain skills, not just IQ. IQ, your crystallized intelligence is just one of those components, and really find out the best way to provide him an educational product. Okay, and this question's been asked a couple of times. Um, so it has a 17-year-old who needs to pass a um, for personal finance class to graduate. They're on an IEP. They're still struggling. Um, what could she look at to support? So you should be able to have in-class support. I mean, you can't have in-class support for foreign language, but personal finance, I'm still working on that class. Um, but if it's part of the IEP, you know, there's always, um, we can look at ways of making sure that he gets extra credit, makeup work, that sort of thing, but he should be properly supported. I think y'all better let Alicia go before she's, I feel like you're going to get the eyeball. Okay, I've got a question here. How do teams determine services for individuals age 18 to 22? Sure, you determine services based on their need for gainful employment, independent living, and further education, right? Which is why we started working on that when they were 14 or 16. What are their post-secondary goals and what do we need to work on to mitigate that? I always recommend the um, Oregon Resource Handbook. It's the most amazing transition book I've ever seen out of all the states. But we're working on things like, you know, changing your uniform, how to fill out an application, how to let your boss know that you're not going to be here for a shift other than telling your friend in the parking lot, right? So those are the goals we're working on for 18 to 22, um, gainful employment, further education, and independent living. It was a great question. It was. Um Someone must have jumped on later. I know at the beginning we answered this question, but Jessica asked, what is the two-day intensive that um, is the prerequisite to the mastermind? Sure. So the two-day intensive is, um, it's two days and it's intensive. We have them in person. We have them online. Day one, it's how to advocate for anyone. It has workbook questions. This is very intense, deep dive on advocating however you sit at the table. And then day two is how to advocate Um, as a profession. Perfect. Thank you. Um, K-Rod asks, are there any tips for teaching educators how to implement an accommodation? Some teachers think it's a choice. I mean, I don't even, I don't even think you need training on how. I think we need training on how to write an accommodation. Check for understanding. I abhor that. What does that mean, right? So I put in check for understanding by having a student repeat the directive. Unfortunately, in most software, we just have this little drop-down menu of accommodations, and we pick them like they're silver hoops, right? Um, you need to have the accommodations just as individualized as you do the IEP goals, and most of them aren't. The next two day is January 14th and 15th, and then Jan- uh, February 18th and 19th. All right, and then um, someone asked, what was your 2023 motto again? No compromise in me. In 2023, boom. Oh. Anybody? Anybody want to join me? <laughs> the, um, the kids in the back, y'all want to join me? Sure. I mean, you don't have um, an someone, option. Someone and I don't think I, I don't think I appreciate that tone. Sure. Let's hear it again, Alicia, from the top. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, someone asked, "How can I sign up?" Just go to specialeducationacademy.com, and it's all there. Yep. Under the training tab. Under the training tab, which is like under, Art, like a Coke the can. The tree and the link tree and the bio. The of the thing link. of the deal. It's above the thing of the deal, too. It's above my hairdo. If a student open enrolls with an IEP, can the school district deny the IEP? No, you can't deny the IEP, but you can certainly deny the student from... Um, being part of open enrollment. I see that a lot. I see uh, families, maybe have four kids, because they like children. And they go to transfer to a school that has open enrollment, and they're like, we'll take those three kids. But Frederico, we're going to pass on him. Frederico. <laughs> Do you guys have a student named Fred? I just made that up. There's probably 10 people named Frederico in here, and I love all of you. 
Um, so, uh, Angel said, how can we help students with dyslexia with significant inattention hyperactivity in the intervention? You know, it's very rare that a student has dyslexia and doesn't have some sort of need in the um, ADHD arena, whether it's inattentive, combined type, um, or hyperactive. And so they often are just first cousins that show up together. So it's got to be a robust product to give them to make sure that we're impacting his behavioral needs and his reading deficits. Uh, Queenie asked, which is now my new name because of the... I like that, Queenie. Queenie, yeah. don't um, you know? She asked, do you have any advice um, for an SLD in dysgraphia or written expression disorder? So written expression is a federal eligibility. Dysgraphia, brace yourself, is not. I... I I know, I, I said it. And you know what your schools do for dysgraphia? Lean in. Yeah, not a lot, right? Um, should there be targeted intervention for dysgraphia? Yes, but if you don't do that in elementary school, it's not going to happen. So I certainly would deep dive on the written expression. How does that impact the student? Do they need assistive technology with that? Do they need specially designed instruction around um, that federal eligibility? Yes, absolutely. Uh, Anna Crochet says she's just over here rethinking her career path. That's Come it. on. I We love a good crochet. You could, like, make us bookmarks. My mamaw crocheted. I thought I could crochet while we had to watch Watergate during the 70s. I was wrong. Christina, Shannon, either one of you want to go or you want me to keep going? See, no, it's... I'm all good. So here's a question. Bossy uh, teachers what... gone, gone wrong should be um, Alicia's TikTok name. <laughs> But that was my that was my nickname for several years. Oh. Was was BB, was Bossy Britches. Oh, Bossy Britches! I don't even know if you're allowed to use that word, Britches. Well, the other one they used, I won't say online right now. <laughs> this is they a family. This is a family training, ma'am. It's a family training. It's family. So, what guidance do you have on to determine a full time versus a part time ED label? So kids don't have labels, packages have labels, children have eligibilities, and so the eligibility opens the door for services. All special ed eligibilities do is open the door for services. And so um, if you have a disability, you, you have a full-time, right? So it's not part-time. Um, however, that disability, whether it's ED or autism or ADHD, you might not see a big impact across certain content areas. I think that's kind of what you're asking. And so based on what a kid needs from bell to bell, or sometimes it's from bus to bus, then we write um, supplementary aids and services and minutes and supports and goals around that. Oh, okay, if you, then, oh I, I just saw an RN. It, it, come on, we just finished with an RN. They're really great and they're really smart because they went to medical school. Um, yes, and yeah. they're good at working with people. They're, they're good at working with people. Like, you know? like people in the emergency room are the same people that you sit at the IEP table. They're not stable. Yeah. Yes. Then there's, let, okay. me just, let me just address this certification thing. I know, swirl around. There's no certification, licensure, any of that to be an advocate. Um, do companies sell you certifications? They do. Do they say take our certification and you'll be certified, bona fide, and glorified? Listen, right at this moment, I'm going to certify, bona fide, and glorify all of you. Um, a great advocate is somebody who loves kids, definitely knows um, how to negotiate the totality of IDEA, um, civil rights laws, and state statutes, and getting it right for kiddos and how to write the entire document from the front page to the last page. But the whole you have to be certified is some bologna sauce. And I know you guys have been ordering the bologna sauce and having it delivered from Amazon, but it's not through. <laughs> All right. Okay. Yes, Alicia, did you have a question? Well, before Christina or Shannon asked theirs, I had a follow-up from Carrie Ann who asked about the OT device. She said, what do I do if they haven't been, and there's always an excuse why they haven't implemented the OT device? So I would, I would file with the U.S. Department of Education Office of Civil Rights or get somebody that knows how to do that. I didn't do it. Not an option. Not an option. I didn't do it. So things are only illegal when you know how to properly file. So... I open all of my trainings with this. Is it against the law for you to go out here on this freeway and drive 100 miles an hour? And the answer that everybody says is yes. You know what they are? They're all wrong. 
it is not against the law to drive 100 miles an hour down the freeway. It's against the law to get caught and for a judge to say it's a problem, right? And until we identify with proper filings and grievances to the district and state and federal level, nothing is going to change. And that's one of the things that we teach really well um, in the mastermind. So we're going to take five more questions. I'm going to count them. All right. So somebody had a question about the Academy, which is uh, tomorrow. And we're in the middle tomorrow. of the Tomorrow. Yes. So the Academy is um, every Tuesday night at 8 p.m. Central Standard Time. We have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hours um, archived on there. You can deep dive. They have workbooks. Every other um, um, I, um, academy is archived for you. Um, in March, it'll be two years that we've been doing it. So we have a lot of content on there. And it's a weekly training so that you can keep up what is happening, what what laws just came out, what guidance just came out from OSEP, what just came down from the state level, what new uh, uh, case is being heard by the U.S. Supreme Court. Because... Special education law is moving, It's and you have to be trained in it. Right now, we're in a series of assistive technology. It's amazing. We have a fancy guest speaker tomorrow night who you don't want to miss, who is a guru for assistive technology as it relates to VOCD, a voice output communication device, or AAC, augmented alternative communication. So um, we want you to be fully equipped as you sit at the IEP table, whoever you are. And so you, you, you should be in the academy. Okay, um, Kate has asked this a few times, ADHD slash PTSD 504, child steals daily from peers, mom says it's PTSD behavior and shouldn't be disciplined. What are your thoughts? So, I mean, I have kiddos that came out of severe trauma, um, and kids do lots of different things um, to survive. I have lots of kiddos that I've served that were um, denied food for years, um, that hoard food. Um, they hoard food at home, they steal stuff from their own parents, their own siblings. And so, um, it's an educational need, right? We're going to address that need, identify it and write a program around to address it. So the student doesn't feel that that's, um, an avenue that they have to take. Lots of schools. Uh, staff want to put kids on a half days. Is that a denial of faith? <laughs> yeah, I I don't even know what half days. I wish they had half days in the 70s because I would have been enjoying the rest of that day in Dripping Springs. Um, so I don't, I don't even know what that is. Why would I agree to a reduction of IDEA? Which is why you should also know that also these goofy virtual remote plans that you all signed off on, which you can all unsign off on, are not codified. They're not legal. So I don't know how you can get in the instructional day in half a day. I'm going to take two more questions. Do you, uh, is the, well, let the little boss, Shannon Jr. Um, and Shannon, I'm going to need you to ask the question with feeling, please. Okay. It's legal to place a non-behavior student in a behavior program when it's convenient for admin. So the criterion for a behavior program is that a student has a behavior intervention plan, um, which is after you have done a formal behavior assessment. So, if you don't have a behavior intervention plan, you don't qualify for a behavioral unit. Okay, this is a really good last question. Okay. Someone asked, what time is the thing tomorrow night? Also, is it live on TikTok? So the, the live. The Academy is what she's talking about. Okay, so TikTok live. We always go live at 7 p.m. Central on Tuesdays. And then the Academy starts immediately after at 8 p.m on Tuesdays, all central standard time, because who doesn't want to be central and standard with their time? And to get to the Academy, because that's not live. It is not go. live. It's, it's a membership only. Yeah. So they go to the link of the deal in the tree and the bio. Yeah. The and it's, there's no contract. If you want to stay for a month, if you want to stay for the whole time, and um, we want to serve you so that you're fully equipped. It's the most amazing group of people. They are ridiculously amazing. They all have the condition called RA. Um, so we love you guys. If you have questions, please don't ever hesitate to let us know at admin at Special Education Academy. If there's training that you want, if there's a training that you want us to do on TikTok Live, we're happy to do that. Um, yes, the Academy is recorded and all the past academies. 
art in the archives, you can see how many blazers I actually have. So we love you. Um, anything else from you, you cats in the back? Um, well, the token cheese head said earlier that she loves you, boss lady. Oh, we love the token cheese head. We're so excited about seeing her in January. Yeah. Because I know you want to come down from where it's her. not 100,000 degrees below zero. No. All right. Well, we love all y'all. All right. Yes. We'll see you guys tomorrow night at 7 p.m. And remember, we get it right for the child. We get it right for everybody. Thank you, guys.